Hey, Chandler Bolt here, and joining me today is Lewis Howes. Uh, Lewis is the New York Times bestselling author of the hit book, The School of Greatness. Uh, he's also got his newest book. It's called The Mask of Masculinity. Uh, you may know him from the School of Greatness podcast, uh, so same name as the book, uh, with over 250 million downloads. It's crazy, and the guests he gets on that show are just unbelievable, um, so you have to check it out. Um, he's also a business coach, keynote speaker, and formal, former professional athlete. Um, today, we're going to be talking about um, using, using books uh, to grow your business uh, and using publicity um, to grow your business, to sell more books, um, something I think Lewis is just really, really, really good at. So I'm super excited about this. Uh, Lewis, great to have you here. Thanks, Chandler. Appreciate it, man. So let's dive in. So kind of, I want to start with, you know, you had a couple early books that were kind of more self-published back in 2010, 2012, yep. and then first, first big book, um, 2015, School of Greatness book. Uh, and this is obviously after having the podcast um, for a few years. Why do the first big uh, book launch with the school, school of Greatness book? And then kind of maybe two-parter, how, how do books fit in with the overall ecosystem of, of growing your business? I think for why, you know, I had my, uh, I just went and grabbed my first original book. I think there's like 20 copies left that I have here. This is my <laughs> self-published book, 2009. This was before it was easy to self-publish when there wasn't a lot of information. You know, your school wasn't out there. No one was talking about how to self-publish. And I remember I didn't have an audience at this time. I was just getting into kind of like LinkedIn, teaching people about LinkedIn because I was using it and seeing results. And people were asking me, hey, can you show me more? And I was thinking, how do I build my brand? And everyone was talking about, you know, the power of a book and the credibility I would watch from influencers who were just bloggers and then wrote a book. And then all of a sudden, boom, they're on big stages, making more money, bigger brand deals, opportunities. I was just like, wow, there's something there. When you have a book, it makes you more real as a, a brand. It makes you more tangible. And I think a lot of us want our first book to be this like big, grandiose, like, timeless classic that a, a lot of us, not everyone, but to be honest, most of us, if we're only a few years in our career, uh, it's hard to kind of write that evergreen timeless book. And I knew that when I was in 2008, excuse me, 2007, going into 2008 Christmas, I just had surgery on my wrist playing football I was living on my sister's couch and I was trying to figure out what am I, who am I in the world, what I want to do with the rest of my life. And I got one present for Christmas. My, my family decided to do the whole white elephant thing where you just give one gift. And my brother gave me a gift and he didn't even wrap it. I didn't even get to un, unwrap the <laughs> gift. He just handed me a book. That's all he did. And he said, Merry Christmas. And that was my only gift in 2007. And I remember checking out the cover and being like, wow, this is actually fascinating, like interesting to me. And I'm, I don't read any books ever. I never read. I almost flunked out of English my senior year in high school. But for whatever reason, the timing of my life, I didn't have anything to do. I was down and out and a little bit depressed because I lost my dream of playing football. I read this book in a few days. And at the end of the book, it opened my mind to like a world of possibilities of like, wow, this is the direction I want to go in. Let me go figure it out. And I went down a rabbit hole. And I remember saying to myself, whoever wrote this book, I'm going to become friends with one day and we're going to do stuff together. I don't know how I'm going to meet this person, but I'm going to be from come friends. And whoever this agent of this book is, was brilliant. Their agent is going to be my agent. I don't even know who it is, but I'm going to figure it out. And they're going to be my agent one day. And I'm going to write a book one day that opens people's minds the way this book opened my mind. Now, I didn't have the credibility. I didn't have the audience. I didn't have the chops yet to go write the book I wanted to write, kind of this bigger idea. But over the next year, I, a year and a half, I was getting more into LinkedIn and I wrote my first book on LinkedIn and self-published this. Now, that book that... I read was the four hour work week and the agent was Steven Hanselman, who was my agent for my last two books. So I wrote this book first linked working because I wanted to make more money in my space. I wanted to make more money, be more credible. 
get more opportunities, be on stage more and build my personal brand. And that's what I did with this. And I partnered with an, another author. We self-published it. I had no clue what I was doing. He guided me and kind of, I wish I had self-publishing school back then, but he pretty much said, here, write this. You write a chapter, I write a chapter and we write this perspective and we'll blend the two. But I had no clue what I was doing and I was fumbling around, but somehow made it work. And I think we sold like 15,000 copies, right? But that, I, you know, it wasn't flying off the shelves. I was hosting LinkedIn networking events. I did 20 events around the country that year. And I would carry and drag boxes of books on my shoulders at the airport or at the bus station. And I would take them to the events that I was hosting and I was hustling. And then every person that walked in the door, I would put a book in their hand and say, will you buy this? It's half off. It's 10 bucks. <laughs> so I was just schlepping books. Yeah, like yeah. an artist is selling CDs in the back yeah, of the room. On the, on the boardwalk. <laughs> so this is what I did for, you know, a year. And it gave me experience. It got me speaking gigs. It got me to do courses and training and webinars where it helped me really build a multi-million dollar business teaching essentially LinkedIn to other people that wanted to learn about LinkedIn. It was a credibility piece that unlocked many things for me. And it changed the trajectory of my life by self-publishing. Now, this book didn't change my life financially or anything like that, but the act of doing it, the act of doing deeper work, of fleshing out my thoughts and ideas, building out my IP, that I could then create articles and content and, and do interviews and have specific stories to talk about, just made me a better human being, I would say. Made me a better a uh, leader in the business that I was growing as I didn't know what I was doing in business. Then I wrote a, an ebook, I think, like a digital book on, on webinars because people were asking me about, can you teach me webinars? But I was like, okay, what I really want to do in my life, this is a few years later, uh, 2015. So I guess it's seven years after I had the idea of wanting to launch like a bigger book. I finally was creating a, a podcast consistently. I was building my audience and it came time where I was like, the agent reached out to me and said, hey, we should do something together. This was the agent of the four-hour work week. And it took me a few years to put this out there. But this was like the book that I put out, The School of Greatness Next, where then I got a traditional agent. I, I did the rounds of all the publishers. I pitched myself. I wrote a 60-page book proposal, all those things to get an advance. And that unlocked things to another level because it was more of a uh, I guess, evergreen, timeless, big publisher book that I went all in on, called in every favor and did whatever it took to do my best to try to hit the New York Times bestseller list. And <clears throat> that was the goal. That was the dream seven years prior was like one day I want to hit the New York Times bestseller list. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Um, uh, I didn't even have a college degree at that time when I got injured and was thinking about that. I was just like, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'm going to do it. Yeah. And and that was the process. And the way I think about books in the terms of my overall, you know, strategy, I guess I've done, let me look at this. I've done five books. I've done, my first one was self-published. Then I did an ebook on webinar marketing to kind of corner that market in that niche. And I didn't print it because I wasn't proud of it. It was kind of just like a little 30 pager. But then I did the school of greatness to kind of make my stamp of like, here's more of my thoughts and philosophies based on sports and what I've created for my podcast and all the great people I've interviewed. So it's kind of like a, uh, I was a knowledge broker and sharing my own information there. Then I, I went into going in a different direction. I wrote the mask of masculinity. I wanted to tap into a different corner of the market, which was helping men become more emotionally available, helping men heal traumas of their past because I was going through personal uh, healing myself from sexual abuse as a kid and finally starting to open up about it. And I was seeing incredible benefits from my healing journey. I was letting go of anger, frustration, resentment, judgment, all these things. And I'm still not a perfect person today, but it helped tremendously. And I realized that a lot of men were suffering in the world and a lot of women were suffering in relationships with men who were suffering. And I said, if I can tap into and be a resource and an inspiration and a how-to for men and for women, then I could do some good and impact people. And so that was the process of that to kind of tap into that. Then I wrote a little mini guide because I was just thinking to myself, <clears throat> what are the top podcast titles that I have? If I look at my top, we're almost at a thousand episodes now. So this was a few years ago, or probably my top 500. I was like, okay, what are the top 10? What do they all have in common? 
And four of the top 10 had the word money in it, something around money or millionaires or habits of millionaires, something like that. So I was like, huh, my audience really wants to learn about the routines of millionaires. And so I wrote a little guide called the Millionaire Morning that I wrote literally in three days. And this is like a small little pamphlet, you know, 30 pages, 35 pages, super short, tight. And I just thought of like, of all the things that I've listened to from these great billionaires and millionaires, what do they do in the morning? Let me talk about their morning routine that makes them rich. And so we did this, and I think we sold like 30 or 40,000 copies of this. But it was kind of like um, we tried a, a free plus shipping style with this. Now we just sell it. Um, and it just like gets sales every day. We're not even really promoting it. It's just people find it, they share it, they like it, and it helps them. It's a little tool. So this was more of like a feeder to see like, is this an idea that people would actually like me to flesh out? Because I don't want to write a big proposal anymore. Yeah. Let's yeah. see if like people are even interested and let's make money or at least break even to see if they're interested. So it's worth my time and energy. And then if I want to, I could take this and go build out something bigger IP. So it's been kind of five different books that I would say. And then I've done two audio books. So I feel like I've done everything in terms of publishing. Um, at least that I can think of right now. And <clears throat> the reason I like them, and I've been working on another book actually for about a year now that I haven't been able to, to finalize on paper that I've gone back and forth on the proposal for. And my COO says, you know, it might just be a big distraction right now writing another book. Um, maybe you don't need a book right now or it's a distraction from, you know, really building out the business and a coaching program and all these other things that can make more money, make deeper impact, these things. And I said to him, <clears throat> you know what, to kind of answer your question of like where do books fit in? For me, a lot of it is just like I like walking into Amazon bookstore, Barnes and Noble, and I like looking at books and I like being in that space. And I, I feel like something good always happens that I can't quantify when I launch a book. And sometimes it's financial, but other times it's like, I just met one person that I got to interview that was really meaningful to interview, which led to other things. Like I never know what's going to happen from it. And the goal is to just, you know, I would like to keep writing books because I enjoy the process. I just also know how much time and energy it takes to make a great <laughs> book and how they're not, truly a big money maker for 99.9% .9 of people that write books, right. unless you have something else that you can build upon it. So that's, uh, that's kind of the process that I think about. That's great. And I love so many great lessons in there. I love the start specific, then get more broad. I love the, uh, you know, your no one's going to read your book. Your no one's, book. Yeah. No one's going to read your uh, seven key secrets to success when you haven't done anything. Like, right, right. No one's going to do it unless you're some psych, <clears throat> unless you're some psychologist who's got years of research or who's tapped into every journal right. and found something yeah. new. It's like just because you were a real estate agent who did a uh, million dollars in sales or a few hundred grand in sales, or you, just because you're a coach or just because whatever, doesn't mean people want to read it. Yeah. And, um, Unless you have some massive following, then may, maybe they will, but that's still not even guaranteed. So, yeah. but they might read it, but no one else will read it. So yeah. you've got to be aware of like, why am I writing the book? Who is the book for? How am I going to market the book? And, um, you know, what are my goals? And yeah. you know, these goals are always, they're not always easy to hit, you know? Which I want to talk about a goal in here in just a second. But I, I also like the way that you look at books of, of cornering markets, right? Like I really want to yeah. go LinkedIn. I want to go webinars. I want to yep. go bigger, more broad. You, you mentioned, all right, what's my goal? How do I hit it? You obviously had a goal hit in New York Times. Yep. Hit it. You said I went all out, called in every favor. Like what does that look like? And well, how did you here's the thing. Times? I, got, I got number two on the New York Times yeah. list. So yeah. It's like, <laughs> oh man, I was so close to number one. And uh, that was that was kind of the ultimate goal, but it's like okay, New York Times yeah. bestseller was still. It was an incredible feeling for me because just because I'm the dyslexic kid who had an English tutor all through middle school and high school and almost flunked English class. So for me, it was an incredible full circle moment. Um, I guess almost 15 years after graduating high school, where I just had the bottom grades in the class never felt 
confident with myself in writing, reading, memorizing work, like anything. My vocabulary today is still probably like a second grader. Uh, I say the same words over and over. I don't have like a broad vocabulary. And what I realize is I can't do this on my own. Like I need other people to support who are way smarter than me. So I didn't write any book on my own, except for, I guess, The Millionaire Morning. And it's probably why I haven't made it bigger and published it because I'm like, it's not that great of grammar. It's like there's mistakes in there and I don't feel, it's great content, but it's not like, I don't want the world to see it at this point, you know, into a big book unless I had a team. And everything revolves back to having a team uh, and, and someone who's smarter than me to help me execute the project. That's what I did with these. Uh, this one, I had someone else help me write it. We had, I had a co-author and we wrote half the book together. These two, I had Ghostwriter uh, help me and a team help me do research and flesh out my ideas. So it's, a, it's all my content. It's all my words. It's just like, how do we package and organize it better? But I couldn't have created those books without that team, without them helping me, guiding my thoughts. What about this and doing that? And what about adding here? And we need a sentence here. It's like, I wouldn't be able to do it all at the level of excellence I would like without that support, without that back and forth, and probably without the editors at the publisher and all those different things as well. So it was a whole team supporting the journey. And um, yeah, and I remember <clears throat> I wrote this book, The Mask of Masculinity. It came out like the month the Me Too movement came out. So as women were having the courage to open up about all the trauma they've been through because of men taking advantage of them. I wrote the book for men to like start to heal and start to open up. And it was funny because I wrote it not because I saw a movement coming about this because I felt like if one man read this and they healed from it and it helped their relationship, it'd be worth it to me. And And it was funny because after Me Too came out, it was like all these men started talking about how to be more vulnerable and how, you know, and they all started saying, I want to write a book about this. And I had already done it, not because I was chasing a trend, right. because I was following my heart and doing right. the thing I felt like I needed to do. It was kind of like every, my, my agent and people were like, you should write a business book next after the School of Greatness. And I was like... I just don't feel called to do that. Like I can do that, but so many other people are doing a better job at that than me. And like, what's my angle? I don't want to just be noise. I want right. to add value. And for whatever reason, I just felt like the mask of masculinity. I was like, this is the thing that I want to write. It's not going to, it's not my, it's not going to be a big money maker. In fact, it's probably going to lose me money, but it's going to connect in my heart. And hopefully other people will resonate with that as well who read it. And I think sometimes you got to write, if you're going to write a book, you got to know what it's going to be about. Like I wrote the New York Times, uh, the, the School of Greatness, and I was like, this is a broad mass appeal book that hopefully a lot of people want to read. I wrote The Mask of Masculinity, and I was like, I hope millions of people read it, and it, it takes off and all these things, but it didn't do as well. It's got a long tail now. It keeps like every day, little, it just keeps sailing every day, a little here and there but it's not like big spikes and crushing, but it's yeah. like a consistent thing that is meaningful to people when they read it. It's like, wow, I was able to connect with my husband more and this and then I'm like, okay, it was worth it to me. So you got to be clear on why you're writing it and what it's for. And I'm assuming most people in self-publishing school are writing it as a business lead generation tool for their brand, for their business, for their coaching, for their consulting, for their courses, for their, you know, to make them stand out as a CEO in their company, as a thought leader. And you just got to know what you're doing it for. Right. And so for you, like, why was the New York Times important with the first book? And like, how did you actually do it? Because we get asked this all the time. Like, what does it look like? What, what were kind of the X's and O's of, of, of that big push? Because obviously it's all focused on the first week. Yeah, I mean, it was important to me because I like to um, measure goals and I like to shoot big and I like to dream and I like to see these things come full circle. And so when I had the dream seven years prior to say, I want to do this, I don't know how I'm going to do it. And I don't know when I'm going to do it, but I want to do it. When I, when I had a big enough audience and built credibility and relationships for seven years and I never asked for a thing, I just felt like maybe I could do it. And if I was to do it, 
what would need to happen? How many books do I think I need to sell? Um, how do I need to strategically launch it? And I, all I just did was interview like 20 different people who were number one New York Times bestsellers. And I said, what did you do? And a lot of them said the same things, but I'd find one tool from each one of them that I was like, okay, I'm going to implement that. I'm going to try this. And I wrote a whole blog post about this with my notes. And I still have the, the image of the notes. If you just write, if you Google how to write a New York Times bestseller with Lewis Howes, you'll see my whole show, my notes about how I did this. And I think I had 12 or 13 steps that were the main things that everyone talked about. And I was just like, okay, I'm going to, what do I need to do for step one? And how do I map out a whole plan for that step? And I just did that with everything. Okay, one of them was a book tour. What's the book tour going to be for me? I created my own book tour from scratch with my audience and I got free venues and I was just like hustling. And I was like, okay, Periscope was big at that time. I was like, okay, I'm going to do live every day on Periscope. This is like on Twitter and all this stuff. And I was like, I'm just going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to go on podcast tour. I'm going to do a webinar tour. I sold a ton of books on webinars at the time. And I was just like, I'm going to tap into every marketing strategy I have, every connection I have, ask for every favor for a post on social media, email blast, whatever it takes for this book. Now, I wouldn't do that if it was like a LinkedIn book at that time, right? I wouldn't be calling in every favor. Exactly. And I wouldn't be saying, hey, bro, can you do this? Can you do this? Like, because there's only so many favors you can ask with your friends or business relationships. Right. And for me, I just never want to push something because you only got so much cash in that bank, you know? So it's like, you got to be smart and strategic and know what, what the book is for. Yeah. Love it. And I'm looking at the article right here. It says bulk book orders, podcast tour, uh, street team, bonus offers, press, guest post, affiliate promotion, uh, book tour, uh, school of greatness podcast, obviously book trailer, social media, online summit, book launch manager. I, I want to talk for and a I second. I did all that. I did all that. Yeah. I did an online summit with like 25 or 26 interviews that I launched for free on top of doing my podcast three times a week. I did the tour. I had a book launch manager because I was like, I can't coordinate this all myself. So who's the top guy? Mm -hmm. um, I did. Yes, yeah, so many different things. I mean, I was like, okay, I'm going to get 500 people who are my core fans and they can be my street team. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. I created a Facebook group for them. Uh, you yeah. know, I gave them an early galley copy that I got my publisher to give for free. If they had to write a review, they had to like share with three friends, like all these things. I was like, what's the micro? What's the macro? Yeah. I did a press tour. And the what press tour. What sold the most books? Um, it's probably the podcast and the podcast tour my mm -hmm. my kind of podcast my your audience is going to do the best if you cultivate them so i look at my audience and my podcast and the kind of book incentive uh book bundle buys that at the time at least five years ago the book bundle was big for me i think i sold like because i had a handful of people buy 500 plus copies from me in bulk and that was the big thing. That's why I always try to look, lean on people and say, don't try to sell 10,000 individual copies. Try to find one person to buy 10,000 copies and distribute right. that. Right. And always focus on, you know, who are the few people that can buy maximum books that then you can strategically figure out a way to, you know, get them to buy it through individual retailers and things like that to help your cause. But um, so I just was like, who are all my rich friends who I've given so much to that, you know, 500 books wouldn't be that big a deal. So I got a handful of people and I was ruthless in my asking. I was just like, Hey man, you know, I've got this book coming out and uh, is there, <clears throat> I would really love your support. And they would say, okay, what can I do? And I was like, I'm looking for people to buy books in bulk who have big companies that they want to give them to their audience. They have got big email lists or they've got coaching programs or membership sites that they want to give a value at. And I was like, what's the maximum you think you could buy? <laughs> so I just would ask people like, what's <laughs> but I also had a great relationship with these people and I had done so many favors over years for them or asking anything in return. So it's like, I had to know who I was going to ask and what I was going to ask them. I couldn't ask that for everybody, but, sure. and if they'd say, Hey, I'll buy a hundred, I'll say, can you do 300? Mm -hmm. And you know, be like, yeah, yeah, I'll get 250. Okay, cool. It's like, I would just, you had to be ruthless in your ability to to ask and people to say no 
because yeah. a lot of them said no. And you got to be okay with a little bit of embarrassment or a little bit of like, ah, was I too pushy? Because yeah. if this is a dream of yours, you've got to be willing to risk sometimes. And yeah. um, if you've done so much goodwill and so much value to people, then they're going to support you in some way. Um, you know, they may not buy your book. And I didn't get mad if someone didn't buy books or whatever, but hey, can I go on your podcast? Hey, can I write a guest yeah. article? Hey, will you do like a little, you know, blurb for me? Will you do something? Mm -hmm. Will you post mm -hmm. on Instagram? You know, whatever it may be, the currency at that time. And, um, and you got to be okay with people, you know, showing up the way they want to show up. They might have a launch or something at that time. So, yeah, that's great. And it seemed like, and, and I want to touch a little bit on this and we got, we're kind of in the home stretch here. And so I want to talk a little bit about publicity and how, how that's played into this whole uh, equation. It seems like the, the, the book tour, I went to um, your stop in San Diego. It seemed like that was yeah. also kind of hand in hand with bulk purchasing. Cause you know, you got 250 people there. Yep. So everyone's buying at least one book. And I remember it was kind of like uh, the book was included with the ticket. Yep. And then I think yep. there was also like a, a kind of a bump of like, Hey, do you want to buy 10 or 25 right. or whatever? And like, so oh, turning seller, that into, yeah. into was like, was that pretty successful? Like, not only I would imagine the copies that got sold there, but the social kind of like, yeah, I think was, everyone was talking about it. There. Yeah. It was like everyone talking about it and sharing on their social media. I don't know how influential it was. I don't know how well yeah. it did, but I think it's always a good opportunity to just see people that are interested in you in yeah. person and connect with people. And, you know, if they say, Hey, check out this book, maybe it has a, you know, a ripple effect. It's not selling thousands, but it's selling hundreds. And for me, it's like, I was willing to do whatever it took. And if even if it sold a hundred books, I would show up Yeah. during, during those first couple of weeks. Cause I was like, whatever, man, let's just sell two books. You know, I'll do whatever yeah. for a couple of books. So that's where I was at. Yeah. Cool. So uh, kind of in the home stretch here, I want to talk some publicity stuff. So I feel like one of the things you do really well is, I mean, you look at the blurbs on all your books, it's huge names. You look at the, 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 the guests on your podcast, huge guests you look at the publicity that you got around this, this book, it's Ellen, the today show, good morning, America, all that stuff. How do you do that? <laughs> and that's a big question, but like maybe more specifically, like any tips on landing big time publicity specific to the books? Like, how do you get on Ellen? How do you get, like, I know those are the big ones, which that's cool. That's not going to happen overnight, but like, yeah. what's the intentionality and strategy behind how you do that? Well, um, a lot of it has been per building my personal brand over the years. And what I think of in terms of building a personal brand, I think of if Ellen or Oprah or Today Show was to land on my site and they never saw who I was and they saw it for five seconds, would they be interested to want to opt into my newsletter and learn more? Or would they be interested in, in having a producer call me to see if it'd be a good fit to have on the show. If my branding on my Instagram and my website is not on a mainstream level, then why would they have me on? Why? Unless I have a, unless I'm going viral right now on my social media for something I said or did or whatever, they wouldn't want to have me on. So I learned early on the power of personal branding. When I was studying this back in 2008, 2009, I remember a personal branding blog by Dan Shawbell that I was reading and guest writing to back in 2009 because he was talking about the power of the personal brand and every author was talking about this. And I was like, let me study this. And for me, I try to differentiate my brand by having incredible photography. And most people don't have great photography. They have some old headshot from six years ago where it doesn't even look like them anymore. And there's nothing fresh and new about it. You got to have something like new, otherwise people are turned off. So I have great photography that I am intentional about. And I do photo shoots a couple of times a year for the purposes of building personal brand on social media and using it for my website and other materials. I uh, focus heavily on um, just un photography and unique design of my website and my, of my content and my creativity of that process with content and website and then the consistency of building the school of greatness and leveraging the power of great interviews with big names draws more attention to who i am and what i'm up to so seven years three times a week for the last five years but every week for seven and a half years of just showing up consistently 
And I think that has been a key factor for me. I don't show up once in a while. I don't post content every now and then. I just do it consistently. And it takes time. It takes energy. It takes effort, work, money, team, all that stuff. And uh, it didn't happen overnight, but it's just like consistently show up and do good things. You, you start to separate yourself from the pack. And I'm constantly upgrading my process, upgrading my quality, upgrading my equipment, my background. Like everything is, okay, what can I do to be better this year? What can I do to be better this year? And I think that process has really helped me. And I'm also, I, a na- I would say a natural networker and I co- actively am thinking of how can I network with writers, producers, hosts, um, executives at media companies. So I'm ah, building, I'm constantly building relationships with personalities who have platforms. And I've been doing that for 11 years now where I'm reaching out to them, emailing them, taking them out to lunch. Um, just if I read an article, I'll mess with them on Twitter. I'll reshare their stuff. Like anyone that I think is doing great work as a media person <clears throat> that I want to be on the show, I'm trying to add value to them as much as possible without asking for anything for years. Then when I have something, hey, can I come on the Today Show? Hey, can I come on Fox and Friends? Hey, can I come on? Just because I became friends with these people. So become friends with media and they'll want to promote you when you have something big to offer. Mm, love that. You can't rely just... on a, you can't rely on a publicist in my opinion. Yes. And I've had yes. publicists over the years. And the reason the publicists have been successful with, with getting me on press is because I knew the people that they were pitching. They knew me and they were aware of my personal brand. And I had a personal relationship with them. Like, Almost 90% of the press that I got from the different PR firms that I hired over the years were from my relationships that they reached out to and pitched. Very often, was there something new that came in that I didn't already have some touch point in that company. And I think that's what people misunderstand. Okay, let me hire a publicist and they're going to do all the work. It's like when you have a publisher. They print the book and they edit the book, but they don't market the book. It's your job to promote the book. Just like... The publicist will coordinate, will send out pitches, but if you have personal relationships, it's going to be a lot easier. So that's what you got to think about. Don't expect the publisher that, to yeah. do anything for you. Don't expect the publicist to do anything for you. And if they do, then great. That's a bonus. Yes. This is all on you. 100%. Couldn't agree more. So I guess the fi- final few minutes we have, I- I'd love to just follow up on that. You talked about, and I love the intentionality around, hey, how do I get in the room with people who have media companies? or at media companies or have big companies in general, you talked about upgrading and refining your process. Like what does that kind of look like that process? And it seems like you're very intention intentional about that. Like, but how, if say, I don't live in LA, I don't, I'm not, I'm not even in social media. Social media is a way you can just research and message someone and find ways to add value. I was getting on the phone with people all the time. I was connecting to them on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, finding ways to, see, oh, do we have anyone in common that I can reach out to and introduce me to? Like, I, I'm just thoughtful in my research and who I'm mm-hmm. reaching out to and how I'm communicating with them. And I'm not asking for anything. I'm saying, hey, this is a great article. This is a great video. Can I help you with anything you're doing in the future? That's how I would lead with everything. It's like, how can I help and serve? It's never, hey, let's meet because in two years, I want to launch a book and I want you to do this favor for me. It's how can I give and give and give and you know, tap into my network to over deliver for you so that it's a no brainer. And it's not, I don't even have to ask. You just say, Oh, I see you've got a book coming out. Let's have you on the show. Cool. Let's do it. And that's the way I try to think about it is how can I over deliver? And that takes effort and time and work and energy. And it's just, you got to think about the marathon and the long run of like, I want to be in this for the long run because I'm clear on my mission. And so I'm going to put in a lot of effort and energy up front. And hopefully it'll pay off when I have something to come out with. And um, as opposed to three months before you launch the book, oh, I need to connect with some people. (laughs) And oh, I need to hire a publicist. And who can market this for me? And please, like, no, you haven't done anything for me. Like, why would I promote this book for you? I don't know you. You haven't, you've just come to me and asked me for something. Why would I promote this? Because you're a nice person? No, like, I've got my own stuff to promote. So it's, you got to be really intentional about it. That's great. And it's even just looking at this 
a New York Times article you got on your site, like you've got a picture of pages. I think it, it's 154 people on a list of like, so it seems like you're very Is intentional. Is that what I have there still? Yeah, I was yeah, like, who are yeah. the people that I've given value to for years who have big audiences that I'd love to do something with, whether it's a, a tweet, a post on Instagram, an email blast, a webinar, right. a podcast. It's like, who are those people? And be intentional, be strategic, add value way ahead of time uh, exactly. and, and build authentic relationships. Love that. Exactly. It continues to build. Well, cool. Home stretch here. A uh, couple final quick questions. Um, so knowing what you know now, you know, you've done five books, some self-published, some traditionally published. Uh, what would be your advice for the Lewis from years ago, pre-book number one, that's thinking like, hey, I'm kind of coming into thinking I'm going to do my first book. Like what would, what would be your advice to all the other Lewis's out there that are kind of like about to go on that journey to doing their first book? Yeah, I would, I would, uh, you know, find a system or a tool or someone who can, can help you, whether that's, you know, self-publishing school because you've got a great process and you help people really execute and have a timeline and get their thoughts out or it's, uh, you know, another platform, but it's figuring out the right platform who can, coach you guide you and help you finish it because the biggest challenge is believing in yourself that you're worth and uh, worthy of la launching a book writing a book and launching it and knowing how to do it it's there's a lot of free stuff out there there's processes out there for free that you can see but a lot of us know how to lose weight but we still don't do it a lot of us know how to go to the gym and lift and know that we need to eat the right things, but we don't do it without the process and accountability on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And that's what you really need is someone to hold you accountable. So whether it's self-publishing school or, or something else, you need an accountability process because otherwise you're going to be dreaming about launching your book for 10 years and never going to do it. 100% love that. Uh, well, Lewis, this has been amazing. Uh, thanks so much. How can people uh, find out more about you, your books, uh, what you're up to? Yeah, I mean, go to, go to School of Greatness podcast. It's free to subscribe over on Apple Podcasts, and uh, you can listen there. You can check out lewishouse.com. Got all my information there. Or follow me on social media at Lewis House. Cool. And some great, great interviews uh, on the podcast. Awesome. Lewis, th thanks so much. Appreciate it, bro.